now something completely different. <laughs> um, I've been talking in front of a thousand of scientists, most of which, most of whom were there just to prove me wrong. But I was never scared like today. <laughs> so this is going to be very difficult. Um, the argument I would like to talk to you will appear probably kind of dry compared to some of the things we hear there today. The only excitement I can attest to it is that uh, it has been the center of my life for the last seven years, as my wife keeps reminding me every day. Um, this talk is about how we can better understand life. And in particular, that form of life that is so dear to all of us, the Homo sapiens. Um, in the beginning, do no harm. He was good enough. But soon, you know how we humans are. We're never happy. So we started to say, is there anything we can do to actually do some better, some good? But as soon as we tried to fiddle with the human body, we crashed against one huge problem, complexity. This is not difficult to understand because each of us has been given one body to experiment with. I'm sure you all recognize how unreasonable how our body can be. What works today doesn't work tomorrow. It's so complicated. In our Western culture, when we are faced with complexity, we frequently resort to an old trick. The Romans call it divide et impera. We take the problem, chunk in part, and look at every part independently. Today, we call this reductionism. And that's what we did. We took the, the human body, we divided in part, gave a name to every part, and then we took every part, divided in subpart, gave a name to every subpart, and so on, and so on. And then we look at every part pretending that it was independent from the rest. And how stupid this might sound, it worked. For hundreds and hundreds of years, our understanding of how human body works increased constantly, together with our, our ability to heal it from diseases. But as usual, it worked it until it worked. And now, as we said in Italy, it's not working anymore. <laughs> Why? Be serious. Let's look at four diseases that contribute to some of the highest socioeconomic burden in Europe nowadays. Cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis. If you look at these diseases, they have very little in common, except one thing. What we see in every patient, the symptoms, the condition that define the disease, cannot be explained by looking only at the single part of the body. The only way to make sense of what we see is to accept that those parts we kept separated for so long Separated or not. And that's a big problem. I mean, we had one trick, and it doesn't work anymore. Take my old mother, for example. <laughs> of course, this is not my mother. My mother is lovely. Tell mama. <laughs> you know how it works with Italian mother. So, this... This old lady, like many old ladies, she has osteoporosis. Her bones are getting weaker and fragile. That's not the whole story. She also doesn't see very well. She doesn't hear very well. Her muscles are getting weaker. So her probability to fall has increased. And of course, smoking doesn't help. How we can conceivably imagine to cope with such a complexity just by looking at one single thing. Of course, it doesn't work. But as obvious as it might be, like every time there is a big change to be made, there are those who resist. So many colleagues of mine 
are still convinced that reductionism is still a fantastic idea. The only problem is to go down to infinitely small. If we look at, at the molecular level, at this magical molecule called DNA, everything will be explained. Why? Because every protein that forms the human body is produced based on a blueprint that is coded in the DNA. So by unraveling the mystery of the DNA for each of us, everything about our body will be explained. This is my answer. You know what I'm doing here? A scientific experiment. I am transforming the proteins that are being expressed by the cells in my screen by applying a point presser. Recent study has proven that it's sufficient to slightly squeeze one cell to change completely the production of proteins. So can we believe that just by having the boot of a receipt we will be able to open the whole restaurant? Of course not. We come to a point where we cannot ditch complexity anymore. We have to face it to carry on and keep increasing our understanding. And in the last 20 years, the best hope for every science of complexity has been computer simulations. So maybe that's the way to look into it. And in fact, we can take all the knowledge that has been produced about every part of the human body write it in mathematical terms, and then produce computer programs that simulate how this particular part will react under certain conditions. We can make a computer program that describes how the organism as a whole operates in certain conditions. We can make a computer program for every organ of our body, for every tissue type of our body, for every cell type and even for every molecular type involved in all the complicated things that happen in our body at every moment. I'm sure you're saying, so what? <laughs> Here it gets interesting. We can also write computer programs that describe how every part interacts with the other parts. And then we can run this huge simulation all together finally understanding how things are connected and how they influence one to each other across space and time scales that are so radically different that it would be inconceivable to, to look at experimentally. And again, I'm sure many of you say, so what? How this is going to affect me as a, a citizen, a human being? What we have built in this process it's called the virtual physiological human. It is a new technology that makes possible to capture, finally, the holistic aspect of the human physiology and pathology. But before this has an impact in healthcare, there is one little magic more that we need to bring in. If I now feed to my virtual physiological human simulation, the data relative to a particular individual, now that simulation will make prediction about the health status of that individual. This is not personalized medicine. This is individualized medicine. We can finally say something about not you because you are about the same age and the same sex and the same disease of another thousand of people but because you are you, with your condition, with your history, because you're smoking. So, back to my old mother, we can create with a virtual physiological human technology a computer simulation that takes an input, all the data about my mother, and account for her osteoporosis, for her muscle weakness, for her increased risk of falling, and also for her bad habit of smoking. The virtual physiological human is the future of healthcare. And in a not so far future, all our clinical data will be stored in digitalized form and pass it to large scale simulation that will constantly predict how our health status is changing because of the evolution of a disease, 
because of a treatment that the doctor decided to give us or just because we are recovering from an accident or an operation. In a word, the virtual physiological human is our best hope to understand life. Thank you very much. Thank you.